guys. Thank you all for coming. Uh, let's thank Jackie for hosting this event. It, uh, it, you know, I, it's, I appreciate you giving us local authors such a platform. So thank you. I want to. Author myself, I know the importance of. As self published author myself, I know the importance of local and small businesses supporting each other, which I actually feel is something my second book does. But we'll get into that a little bit later. First, I also want to thank all my family and friends who have come and supported me today. I really appreciate you being here. It means a lot to me. And then, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Zach, um, and I am a published author. I have two words to my name. Uh, both my books are nonfiction, and uh, both my works are nonfiction. And once I get into the flow, this, like, escaping memories from a stop in the future will be all good. Um, and I have two books which I, what I would like to do is tell you about each one of those today, read an excerpt from my first book, and then take questions afterwards. So, does that sound good with everyone? Let's see. Uh, good, good, because otherwise this could have gotten really awkward really fast. Uh, I want to start with my second book since I kind of referenced that first already. Uh, the book is titled Rock Realities. I, uh, so I published it back. It's available on the Kindle end up as well as with my, the book I'm going to talk about later, Off Balance. Uh, so Rock Realities is available on the Kindle end up. I published it last December actually and the, it contains Articles I have written, each based off interviews with different musicians. These musicians are largely in the pop, rock, indie, alternative scene, and they and this is where the local business, uh, local businesses supporting each other theme comes in. Local, uh, they are independent for the most part. The authors or the musicians interviewed uh, are uh, independent musicians from across the country from in Los Angeles, California, Team Sleep, Todd Wilkinson, to the other end, uh, Jesse McGee, uh, Lex Stronger, and Baltimore, Maryland, so close to the coast. And these are musicians who I feel are you know, great acts that, you know, they're very talented that you're not hearing on the radio, so I hope through Rock Realities to help get word out about that. And that was one reason I wrote Rock Realities. There was also, I had aspiring musicians in the back of my mind as I was writing too. With aspiring musicians, I was thinking that they, you know, aspiring musicians, so I want someone who's just got their first guitar or they just started a band and, you know, they could, ex they could glean the experiences from other people, uh, you know, who, with mus other musicians who have more, ta who have had more experience with that band. Uh, you know, so for example, in Rock Values with both Jesse McGee and then Stacy Randall, who was an act from Nashville, Tennessee, that, uh, they both talk about in depth with me the lessons they learned going from the, their debut album and to their second album to their sophomore effort. So with that, you are going to be that real look inside that can help prepare an aspiring musician to what the recording process and the, the process of creating an album is going to be like. And, you know, and I could go on now and talk about the other musicians I interviewed for the book and real, and just hit po a couple of key points that each one talked about, but I don't feel like that would do our time here justice. I really think for an author, the credibility of an author isn't so much what 
I can get up here and tell you about my books, but what other people are saying about my books. And so I want to give you guys some insight to what some people are saying about rock realities. And I'm going to start with a Alan Cross, who is a music journalist. Of, he's been covering music as a journalist for over 30 years. So this guy, he's got experience under his belt. He's seen a thing or two in the music business. And for his website, a journal of musical things, this is in part what he had to say about rock realities. At least 50% of the music business involves business, which means as a musician, you better be prepared to deal with what's out there. Zachary Cannell has written a book called Rock Realities, which offers some serious truth about what you need to know. And then recently, I was actually on an online uh, radio show, a podcast called It Matters Radio to promote rock realities, and the co-host of the show had some kind things to, to say. And in particular, uh, uh, Kenneth Green called the concepts to rock realities fascinating. And then there's the musicians who, themselves who've been interviewed. And uh, one musician enjoyed the interview so much, he volunteered these words to me. He got in touch with me later on and volunteered these words to me about the experience being interviewed to rock realities. Zachary was a pleasure to work with with his latest book, Rock Realities. His process for interviewing was thoughtful and fun. And Steve, what was really interesting about Steve is, and the reason I chose him, is he's part of the, he's part of the band from Rochester, New York, called Holy Lizzie. And the band, at the time of our interview, had not played a show outside their home state in New York. But they have yet, on Twitter, a very respectable 20 thousand plus Twitter followers and for those who don't really appreciate social media or go so what, what do those numbers really mean, that that Twitter following is what got um, Holy Lizzie to help get their first gig outside of their home state of New York, which actually happened to be last August in Cleveland, Ohio, so you know, it's just a little fun fact that, you know, spring one there. And so Having you know, that the tour, there are practical, you know, it comes to practicality having a kind of following like that. And so that is, again, something other musicians or basically any entrepreneur can appreciate because social media is, is a cheap, effective way to reach a new audience. And I, I, Dislike that fact that I just use cheap there because cheap sounds cheap, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an efficient way, it's an economically efficient way to, uh, to spread word about your, you and your business. And at this point, I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk to you guys about my first book. Uh, and it's, it's a much more personal tale for me. It's, much more personal tale for me. It's a memoir called Off Balance. And I don't know if you can tell or not, but I have a neurological disability called cerebral palsy. And cerebral palsy is really interesting because it's different for, um, it's just different for everyone. It, uh, like, who has it? Some people use wheelchairs, um, you know, some people use wheelchairs uh, to get around, or they use walkers or other mobility devices. Others talk with a slurred speech, or they don't, they can't vocalize their thoughts at all and uh, rely on assistive technology to help express themselves. I, you know, I'm obviously fortunate. I'm expressing myself right now, standing on my two legs. I walk with a limp. Uh, you might go through a couple of tremors. I, you know, it's not so much nerves as kind of like the addition of cerebral palsy in there. But uh, so I, you know, I walk with a limp. I have tight, you know, 
my super plug talks spastic, so I have tight muscles that are, you know, just additional challenges to my daily, makes daily stretching and everything more familiar, and actually, my childhood PT is in the back there joining us today, and so she can attest to, uh, like, you know, she, uh, you know, knew my body pretty well as she was my therapist for uh, elementary school to, um, college and uh, uh you know junior year of college and so that's you know so it's just and most probably the way it affects me the most is i i let my poor hand-eye coordination uh stop me from driving which creates no no other you know so that creates transportation issues that the average person probably doesn't deal with but again all this stuff is nothing compared to what other people with cerebral palsy deal with, the wheelchairs, the assistive technology they need. You know, I'm, you know, I cannot express enough how I'm fortunate, and that's something, going back to my uh, therapist, back in the day, Trish, and my parents, they tried to express to me when I was growing up, but at, back then, I just didn't have, I didn't know enough, I didn't know anyone else with cerebral palsy, so I didn't, that I couldn't really get understand what they were saying, and I don't know if I had the maturity. So me as a 29-year-old, right now talking to you all, I can say I, have, you know, I, I can, I, I'm coming here with lost train of thought, but I'm gonna go and get it back. You just walk. I'm gonna get it back. Um, of everything, uh, you know, of, as a 29-year-old, 29, 29 I can reflect back and see that fortunate. But a 15-year-old, Zachary, standing here and talking to you would have a very completely different tale. And that's where my memoir, Off Balance, comes into play. Because you see, we live in a society where when you're different, it really comes along with a lot of negative sediments. From the, the cerebral palsy community, you can see it, or with cerebral palsy, you can see it when you are, when the main, when the media, anytime the me, mainstream media covers someone's cerebral palsy, you're likely going to see a word like, cerebral, you're going to see terms like cerebral palsy sufferer and cerebral palsy victim. A very negative connotation. And that's what, you know, as our society was exposed to, that in part, I think, reflecting back, I think that, you know, now, and when I was writing off that one, I think that's what caused some of my negative feelings towards my cerebral palsy. I felt embarrassed because I had cerebral palsy. I felt like, you know, I was, what? I was, I was encouraged because I had cerebral palsy. I just wanted to blend in and be like everyone else. I... Then there's just, I also felt lesser than because I was, you know, weaker than my peers. So I, you know, I, I just felt, you know, on a physical, just a physical level, I felt lesser than too. And that was, you know, that's how, I, you know, growing up, that's how I felt. And so though, it, I think I explained those negative emotions, go into detail about those negative emotions, go out, and I try to hide my cerebral palsy because it's mild. I do everything, and the main way I try to hide it was by not talking about it. I, I know a perfect example would deal with phys, I, uh, physical therapy I had with. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a local author. I was, you know, a published. I was, you know, living here. I wrote my books and published them. I was also educated in this, it's the South Eagle and her school system. So I'm a local in all the, you know, in all the facets that can be locally educated and locally published. And so going back to elementary school when I was at Adrian, I had a physical therapy with another physical, uh, with the school's therapist who worked for the school system. And she would come and she would pull me out of class. Uh, uh, she came one time, I don't remember the period I was in, but she came and pulled me out of class. So we could go, uh, so we could go the spare music, to go to the active music room, which is where I did my, uh, physical, where we did our physical therapy. And where she, when the kid next to me goes, is that your grandma? 
Rather than explain how I should, you know, rather than explain how no, I should look for therapy, I was just like, no. In such a way, I gave this kid a look, no, and just with that tone of voice saying, don't ask me follow up questions. And that, you know, that kind of behavior is led to really an introverted self for me. Uh, I, 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 I just, I kept to myself, and that just, it, it, it just had a, as the years went on through high school, it had a ripple effect, and, you know, with my social standing, with, you know, or my social lead, too, with my social life, and that's the big thing about, uh, you know, that's about off balance. It's not a medical look at the diagnosis. It really takes on the social stigmas involved with living with a disability. Uh, especially at, during the adolescent years because I feel like those are really formative years for everyone and helps develop who we become as people so those are very important to uh, to uh, you know very important time to uh, very important time and so I want people to get make the most of that time for them which is part of the reason I wrote Off Balance without being ahead of myself a little bit because obviously I'm staying here right now talking to you guys and uh, you know, and I'm not, there's no embarrassment from me about having, uh, about having cerebral palsy. I'm up here, and so, you know, obviously something happened between when I was 15 and growing up to now that I've been able to embrace, uh, embrace this and, and accept and embrace it as a part of who I am. And so, that, you know, that all comes, you know, a lot of that stems from, there's a pivotal point for me was high school graduation, and then a little bit, I'm going to read an excerpt from my memoir that talks about high school graduation. I think, I actually, I had, since that high school graduation was such a pivotal point, I went to my uh, college, or uh, high school reunion, 10-year high school reunion last November, and I, did, I just went there to meet up with old, uh, old friends and just... You know, and, get, and let people know who I feel like, what, what I call the real Zach instead of that introvert that I was back in the day. Oh. But coming out of it, I really felt like if there was more to, like, it would be a fitting addition to Off Balance. So I really like the epilogue, and this is one of the benefits of, you know, self publishing, um, self publishing and having it on the Kindle and the. Uh, is that I, I went, I was, I was able to write up an epilogue, edit it, do, you know, go the whole nine yards, make sure it's quality, and then, then upload the edition to the Kindle and the Nook. And so if anyone here who's got my book and just like, well, I already bought your book, how do I get the edition? The Kindle does have, like, uh, does have a chance to download updates, so you'd have to go into your Amazon account and do that. And, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm not here to instruct Amazon Kindle <laughs> tutorial. I'm here to talk about my book. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. And so just writing, I just, um, in the epilogue, I really describe what I really describe high school graduation as an epiphany moment for me. The, the rest is, I just had this, you know, it was just, it was a very important moment helped lead me to become the person I am today. And, you know, it, it, the, it starts with high school graduation, but then it goes down to when I went to college and learned in college down the road. And the faculty and the staff and my peers there, for the most part, when I, I found ways to bring up my cerebral palsy, because at that age, you're not going to go to someone and say, hey, why do you walk like that? because that's rude and there's a fear of doing that. So when a situation came up and I, because the people still wondering, like they're like, why does he walk like that? Or, you know, and they, I can't ask, that'd be rude. So I would find ways to bring it up in conversation just to put it out there and then move on. And just so that mystique isn't there. So mystique is good. I I thought that mystique was distracting and not good. Um, so I wanted to, you know, so the, at the time in college really, you know, Help me then go another another level of going from just being a, you know being able to talk about my cerebral palsy to uh, really accepting it. And actually, two of 
my or two of the professors I interacted with regularly at Notre Dame College are right here today, uh, Tony Zipanzik, who's my academic advisor, and Tony Laverde, who I sh I sh I'm sure him support over the years. He's a, he's a musician himself, and so I've been to some of his shows and stuff. So, you know, and, and again, you know, so it's, it was you, it was, it was the two of you, it was the people at Notre Dame College that really helped shape me to become the person I you know, that, yeah. and, you know, an indi a specific individual who really starts, so it's like, okay, now this is great, but what was that moment that you decided you were going to write a memoir? Like, what, you know, what, what was that? And that came from another professor at Notre Dame College, Sister Korea. And Sister Korea, she had me for music theory class when I was a senior, and then three years previously, she had me for the whatever the opening intro, uh, intro theology class required was. And that, that class, the theology class involved, so, um, the theology class involved writing reflection papers. And I took it as an opportunity to get personal and really, ex you know, I, I took it as the opportunity to get personal and explore uh, and just kind of like, and, and so, being personal with those essays, Sister Korea really got to know my story and the kind of things I dealt with for cerebral palsy. So fast forwarding back to senior year, I'm handing in my music theory final to her. And Sister Korea, uh, she grabs me by the arm, I won't forget, she looks up at me, you know, I'm not tall myself, I'm 5'6", and Sister, you know, so Sister Korea may be 5'2", 5'3", I don't know if that information for the wall is right, but whatever. You know, and she grabs my arm, she looks up at me, and she says, Zach, you are an inspiration to anyone who has to overcome struggle. And that just, it was the first time in my life I've, I've heard someone use the word inspiration like that in my name in the same sentence. And I never considered myself an inspiration. I was just doing what my life, you know, what the challenges I had in my life, whatever those were, I was just, I was just meeting those and getting past it, you know, sometimes overcoming, other times just enduring and surviving, whatever the case may be. But Sister Korea's comment, I, it stayed with me. And I, and I thought, I'm like, if Sister Korea could find inspiration, maybe someone else would. And I have, this, I have a skill as a writer, so I decided to write the memoir. And uh, almost instant, well, not almost instantly, I started writing it when I graduated in May 2009, and it came, it was published in December 2011. The, the you go through, as the other writers in the room will tell, authors in the room will tell, you go through experiences where you're writing a manuscript and you go, this is no good, and you like delete it from your computer or print it out so you can couple it up and be all angry, whatever, <laughs> you know, and um, so I, you know, but once I got the finalized version of Off Balance out there that was, um, you know, that, that is the published version now, which you, you can get either now as a talk, you know, if you have a Kindle and Lip with you, you can, I uh, you know, go to Amazon and search Off Balance by Zachary Farrell and pick it up, but Doing, uh, doing, where are she? That, wait, I had to get that plug in there, and now I lost my train of thought again. Uh, <laughs> final version. Yeah, it's the most final version. As soon as, see, I know I invited everyone for a reason. We can pick up on the dogs now, uh, the power of movies, all right. Uh, so in the final version, as soon as I start sending it to people, uh, the, it, like, the feedback has been amazing. Uh, you know, and going back to a point I brought up earlier about credibility. You know, you, I can say as much as I want in my book. And Tony, you know, as I was working on the book, he was very, you know, he was very vocal about this with me. He's like, Zach, you know, in constructive criticism, like, who cares? You know, who cares about you? You're not, like, you're not a former president. Why is someone going to read your book? You know, and it wasn't, you know, Off Balance is my story, but it's more than the Zach Fennell tale. It is a cerebral palsy memoir. 
And so, again, going to credibility, it doesn't matter what I say, but what about what other people say in the street world policy community? So I went and I, and I, and I, and I sought out um, individuals who have established themselves as leaders in the CP community. And I asked them, like, would you uh, review a digital, like, uh, if I send you an advanced copy, advanced digital copy, would you review it? And if you like it, give me, uh, you know, a blurb I can use to promote. And they're like, you know, and the feedback started rolling in, and it, it was, you know, amazing. John W. Quinn, who is an author himself, uh, he, he's written a uh, book, Someone Like Me, an unlikely tale, an unlikely tale of challenge and triumph over cerebral palsy. And John, he um, is Detroit, Michigan. He lives in Tucson, Arizona now. He's a remarkable guy. He has a mild diversion of cerebral palsy myself. And he, and he, he went on, he had to hide the CP from his, from the Navy, but he wanted to serve in the Navy. And he was able to hide the CP. Wow. He, he, you know, and uh, uh, there's, I could spend most of my time talking about John's book, but then that'd be, you know, That'd be a, that, you know, that's not what I'm here for. But I, you know, I, I recommend his book as well. But bottom line is, like, John, after he read my, you know, after he took a look at the digital version that I had, you know, sent to him, John wrote me a part to say about off balance. This is a rare book that pulls back the curtain on teenage life with a disability in a way that is honest compelling and heartfelt. Off balance should be required reading in every high school in America. Aww. And you know, the praise kept coming in. Uh, Tony Bartoli, who is a, uh, he's he got through the palsy himself, and he was bullied a lot as a kid. I do have a little trouble saying bully versus bullying, so I'm not talking about rolling down and hitting pins. I'm talking about, you know, you know, you know, picking on people and calling them names or pushing them down, the, the worst case scenarios, that kind of stuff. So the, the, the he, you know, he's now, he's found his passion and he's traveled across our country and he's actually been to the United Kingdom, Mexico, and Canada to share his anti-bullying message. And he also agreed to take a look at the advanced digital copy. And these were his comments about or about Off Balance. What Zachary Pinnell has done with his book, Off Balance, is tremendous. With the descriptions, the wording, and his first-hand true life account, Zachary will move many to rethink, so what is a disability? I laughed, I fell into deep thoughts, I reflected, even had three to four tears pour out. By the end, I had my heart pounding out of my chest, and ready to dive back into the book again. And as great as Tony and John's feedback had been, and others who also gave me their feedback, there was, the, I, there has been nothing better than getting the customer to, uh, on, on Amazon Kindle and Barnes & Noble, the average customer review is four and a half stars out of five. And, uh, you know, to get the feedback from your readers has been the most incredible. Like, it, it's, that's been the most rewarding part about this. I had a father who wrote me that, he, 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 man, this came out in December 2011, and I kind of refreshed it by adding the epilogues and stuff. But, you know, I've talked to some of the other, uh, some of the auth other authors uh, here today about how books are timeless, and this is just an example of that. Uh, is within the past two years, I had a father write me who said my book put him in tears because he felt like he was reading about his son who is currently a teenager with cerebral palsy. And he asked, and I was, he asked me for some advice about, you know, kind of like, because I've been there on the other side of it, you know, it's that idea of, you know, that I would latch on my parents, like, you don't get it because you don't have it. And so that, you know, I was able to give him some advice there. And then there have been others who have said, Others with cerebral palsy who've read my memoir and they, they, they tell me afterwards, they're like, I don't feel alone anymore. And even one person who wrote me and said that, you know, they, they were at a point in their life where they didn't know they wanted to live anymore. Uh, no. And then reading off balance helped them persevere 
through that dark time. And to me, that is the, the most valuable thing you can do with your life, is have an impact on other people. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about how big of a house you have or if you drive, what kind of car you drive. It's about what are you doing to make life better for others. And, you know, at this point, I really, you know, I've kind of hyped it up enough where there's, like, there's nowhere to go from here. Like, I've hit kind of like that. But that's, that, that's, 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 that's song you hear on the radio and they go, then they play another song and they go, really? They're following it up with that? Like, you can't, you know, you can't, like, that, 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 the only way I call this up is to read an excerpt from Off Balance. And so I'm going to do that. And this is, comes from Chapter 6, Not Enough, and it talks a lot about the high school regrets I had. One of, it, 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 finish, it takes off after I finish talking about um, the prom senior year. I didn't go to my prom, and that's one of the things I'm like, I regretted not going, but I didn't go because I was too much of an introvert to even really make plans to go. So this is... Uh, this picks up right after that. My prom hopes may not have worked out, but at least I could look forward to graduation. Graduation filled me with a bittersweet emotion. Despite my private, non-talkative nature, I took comfort in seeing the same faces, some of whom I went to school with the past 12 years in the hallway and classroom year after year. Faces like Nate and Zach and Dave over there. And uh, the idea I may never see some of these people again began to set in. Realization I went to school with the same peers for several years, but outside, yet yeah, outside a handful of people, no one really knew me, and I didn't know them, danced in my head as mom dropped me off at high school one final time. And that's my mother back there Aww. in the pig, and then uh, my father next door. Oh, nice. And uh, immediately after exiting the car, Aww. I sent a vibe reflective of our graduation gowns. The white gowns worn by the girls symbolized the pure excitement within the air. The gold worn by us males represented the royal entitlement most of us felt as new high school graduates. I ascended the three steps without a rail leading into the gymnasium so I could check in. Ascending steps without a rail wasn't a mindless activity for me due to my poor balance, but the task still proved fairly easy when I concentrated on shifting my weight. Inside, my former guidance counselor, who retired after my junior year but came back to see her former students graduate, pinned a white carnation above my right breast. I walked back outside where my fellow classmates buzzed with anticipation while boarding the school buses set to take us to Palace Theater in downtown Cleveland, our graduation venue. As I reached the three steps without a rail, I stopped and looked down at my feet. The right one towed in slightly like usual. It's not towed in as much right now. That means I've improved over the years. I've been really big on exercising, so that, that's a good sign. Uh, so, uh, let's see. I'm going to slip the page. Excellent. 
to make the task to make the task more difficult, I wore dress shoes. The standard tennis shoes I normally wore contained an insert with a slight lift in my right shoe to combat a slight leg height discrepancy I had. I froze for about 30 seconds before looking around. I could ask a peer for help. I also could have asked Sammy and Brad to slow down two years earlier at the auto show, but I didn't. Following a careful decline, I boarded my assigned bus, taking the first seat on the bus's right-hand side. I stared down at my fingers, absent-minded, while excitement rang from the vocal majority. When our bus arrived downtown, I received a personal escort into the building. I leaned against the wall leading into the actual theater, and I watched the graduating classes, friends and family, enter to take their seats. My peers stood with vigor on Palace Theater's second floor. My parents and school officials made arrangements to have me wait on the first floor because the rails accompanying the venue staircases were more decorative than functional. As I stood alone waiting for the commencement ceremony to begin, the isolated and awkward sentiments I became too familiar with early on in my high school career came back to me. My old not-so-friendly feelings gave way minutes later when the opening notes from pomp and circumstances began to play within the theater. Oh yeah, I thought, mimicking former WWE wrestler Macho Man Randy Savage, who used a version of pomp and circumstances for his entrance music. A quick smirk later, I went from playful to intensely fearful as I turned to see my fellow graduates beginning their march down the venue's grand staircase. I worried I'd miss the person I needed to get behind and thus ruin the graduating class of 2005's entering procession. Hey Zach, Elaine, the person I needed to get in line behind, exclaimed, waving her hand in the air, accidentally knocking off her graduation cap. She swiftly recovered her fumble that took my rightful place within our procession line. After we took our seats, anticipation built with speeches marking the occasion's significance. And I think one of those speeches was from our classmate Jason Pryor, who is this, who is going to be in the Olympics this week in uh, fencing. So I wanted to, you know, yeah, I actually interviewed Jason, you know, before before I his child. So I, I thought that was, you know, just great. You know, another local going, you know, doing some great things. So he's going to be representing in the Olympics in fencing. He's actually on the Today Show. And, uh, and, uh, right, so. The time finally came for the diploma presentations. I screwed along as our move, as our row moved towards the tunnel leading to the stage, quickly filling with anxiety when I noticed the space between the person in front of me and I grew. I increased my pace, only to trip over my own foot. Relax, take your time, I heard the girl behind me say, as I successfully recollected my balance without falling. My mind caught up in the moment, went numb, with each name called drawing me closer to the stage. You could tell how well liked someone was based on the reception given by our fellow graduates. Directions given at the start of the ceremony to hold applause and cheers until the end quickly became a casualty of the enthusiastic atmosphere. I inched closer to the stage, my thoughts still blank. Zachary Pinnell, the school administrator, called out. Sucking in a deep breath, I moved towards center stage. Clap, clap, clap. Hands smacking together, ringing my ears as I received a very respectable applause. Surprise and pride mixed together. Pride naturally consumed me as high school graduation is a great milestone in life. The surprise came from the reaction I received. I had no reason to expect much of a reception, considering how closed off I had been to most of my classmates. I beamed with happiness as I approached the three steps exiting the limelight. Just like the stairs in front of the school gymnasium, no rails existed to offer support. 
Two vice principals stood on either side of the stairs to assist the girls descending the steps in high heels. I reluctantly accepted the vice principal's helping hand and still made the footing my previous elation. That's right. You are inferior, my thoughts teased me. By the next day, though, taunting regrets were replaced by teasing thoughts. And I could go on, but I would like to open up the room for if anyone has any questions. Again, so about either off balance, uh, about rock realities, or just anything in general about me, I, they, both my books are available on the Kindle and Nook. I have a website that, you know, easy for you to kind of like click to. So, oh, I can't remember this or, you know, you know, whatever. So, you know, I have my website. I have business cards. If anyone wants one of my business cards, um, feel free, you know, to come see me. I'll, and I'll, I'll give one to you. And maybe I'll leave a few with Jackie if she will. We also have a link to that on our website. Yes, yes. And so with that, does anyone have questions? Jack, I'm going yeah. to make a comment. Okay. As a fellow writer, first of all, you are an inspiration. Secondly, um, as a fellow writer, you have a platform, and you should go speaking about your platform. And in addition to that, instead of just having an e-book, you should go on CreateSpace and make some print-on-demand copies so that when you come to events like this, you can hold autographings and sell your books. Because when people hear you speak, they're going to be motivated, and they're going to want to, right now, to read your story. So instead of having them go to a Kindle, which a lot of people don't have, and people cherish autographed books, they're very important to them, I think you should go on CreateSpace and get a print copy made of your book and get some copies and market them with your speaking engagements. And I think you'd be yeah. highly successful in speaking and selling your books. Yes, thank you. you so know, that's that, one author's advice to another, okay? I appreciate it. You know, that's the, really the, the big, the, one of the most troubling things about being a self-published author is, not troubling, one of the most challenging is there's so much, you have so much freedom to, um, to like, you know, there's no structure. It's not like, when I was in college and like, you know, I was editor of the, the uh, Notre Dame College uh, student newspaper and, you know, you have classes and then you work, you know, around your class schedule to get ready for the, like, you know, news. there's always so much, like, there's a lot of, you know, so that's one reason, like, you know, it's one of the challenges I feel as, you know, uh, is the, um, is one of the challenges is finding, like, you know, is making the time, making the, saying this is the priority. And I will know, but again, you know, just because something's a challenge doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. If anything, it means you should do it because then it's just going to make you better. And if anyone knows, I mean, that's a, another one, if you know in, and I'm not trying to be a beggar up here saying, hey, kid, let, me come to, let me come to your house and let me talk to you. Like, you know, so if you know any... Um, if you know any venues, uh, if you work for a school, you feel like students might be valued to hear my message, or you know any kind of organization like that, a school, you know, college, any kind of um, any kind of facility, you know, that serve, especially that serves disabled people, you know. Please give me a, uh, you know, I would appreciate, you know, you giving me a nudge to say, hey, Zach, I recommend you check out this person. So you can do that on, um, you know, you can do that. Find, I'm, I'm planning to stick around for all the authors today, so I hope you do the same. Uh, discover some mo uh, more uh, authors. But, yeah, so you'll find me, you know, and quietly, so we're not interrupting the other authors, say, hey, you know, I think you should try, I think you should go here, and, or, you know, you should inquire to them about speaking, so I, you know, that would be great, you know, you know earlier there's a, you know, theme of a team, and we're all on each other's team, if, as long as we want to be, you know, and I, you know, and so if we're, on, like, you know, you can be great teammates and be like, hey, Zach, I think you would be good here, and I have this contact person, so let me know, is there any other questions, comments? Uh, breakout dance moves someone wants to share? Yes, Tony. Well, you're talking, actually, uh, talking about all the emotions that you went through. It, you go through high school. Yeah. You hinted at some anger okay. at your parents, okay? Yeah. Can you, can you point to some other 
angry uh, feelings that you might have had with someone else, not necessarily your parents. What were the kinds of things that really pissed you off? All right, great question. Great question. All right. This is, I think, you know me, I'm not a very angry, I can, I have my moments, like everyone has their moment, but you, uh, for the most part, it's like, you know, it's like deal with the situation and find a way, you know, this would be, this would be an example of a moment, I get angry, but a moment where anger would be a bit, um, and this is actually a very expected, um, I got angry, especially back when I was very timid about my cerebral palsy, I got angry when people tried to offer me help. Like, I really, I, I would be like, I can do this. Um, I remember one time, it, it was right after, I had surgery when I was 14, and my right leg ended up being temporar temporarily paralyzed after that, and that's all in details and off balance as well. And uh, I remember my uh, grandparents flew in town from Arizona, and I and Papa flew into town to help my cousin. I have two brothers. My older brother, Bill's back there, and his uh, wife, Michelle, and they just bought a house, so congratulations to them. And uh, my younger brother is about to start graduate school in Maryland, so he's not gonna, he's not here with us today. Uh, but uh, I have two brothers, so they two brothers and me in the hospital. Uh, you know, my grandparents came in to help, uh, you know, help my parents take care of everything. And my, uh, so I was very like immobile. At that. I had a bulky brace on, and I was using a walker to get around because I just like I was coming back from. I was basically at 14 years old. I don't want to walk again. And Pop was like, oh, well, he's like, you know, let me help you do this. And Pop, my grandfather was a very gentle and you know kind soul. And when. You know, he's like, let me help, and I just kind of lashed out at him, like, I'm fine, Papa, and, like, you know, it was just kind of like, that was some, that was a moment where it's just like, that, the anger got, real, like, that's where the anger came in, it's just like, so when I'm trying to do something on my own, and someone to come back, help without asking, that, those were when those angry moments that came together. You're a truth teller, because the only time I felt that you were angry at me, this one time in the parking lot at Notre Dame College. I think it was 21 years old. It was the first time I was taking you for a beer. <laughs> By the way, he's a really great guy to take out for a beer because, one, and he's Spanish. So, <laughs> but seriously, the only thing you were ever ticked off, not lousy grades or anything like that, was we were in the parking lot and I, I went to grab your arm. And you didn't say anything nasty, you didn't scream at me or anything, but I could feel the vibe. So, it's like that kid who's like, is that your grandma? And I'm like, no. You know, that was the death stare. Yeah. The real death stare. The introverted death stare. All right. And, um, but it is 2 o'clock, so we're going to let the next author come up and get started. And, um, do, you, do you have start up to do anything? Uh, we, okay. Then, uh, now, I send, I receive the floor to him, if that's the proper word. Yeah. Thank so. you.